persons disqualified persons disqualified from appointment persons disqualified from appointment as company secretary persons who do not qualify to be considered for appointment as company secretary one of the persons who goes into this list of persons we will not be considering for appointment is the sole director the sole director the sole director of a company the sole director of a company will be disqualified from appointment into the position of the secretary and you would know why we said this earlier for independent purposes since the company secretary is an advisor to the board where you have a board of only one director if they also serve in the position of the company secretary they will not be independent in the advice that they should be giving themselves acting as both company secretary and a director of the company the other persons who are disqualified from appointment are persons who are lacking in capacity to serve we are talking about uh, a bankrupt person a bankrupt person if you have been declared as a bankrupt you cannot serve in the position of company secretary if you are um, a minor if you are a minor you will not be qualified for appointment into the position of company secretary uh, if you are a, a person uh, or an insane an insane an insane person an insane person so not having not having a sound not having a sound mind that is also a person who will not be qualified for appointment as company secretary uh, a person a person uh, not having a person not having experience a person not having experience uh, that the board that the board considers that the board considers necessary that the board considers necessary uh, for the company secretary that the board considers necessary for the company secretary and then lastly a person a person disqualified a person disqualified a person disqualified by a court a person disqualified by a court uh, from taking part a person disqualified by a court from taking part in the management from taking part in the management of uh, a company a person disqualified by a court from taking part in the management of a company all these persons will not be qualified for appointment we are referring to them as disqualified persons from appointment as secretary uh, the reason why the sole director is disqualified is for independent purposes they will not be sitting on the same chair as the advisor and the recipient of the advice the bankrupt the minor and the insane person all these three lack the capacity to occupy the position of company secretary then number four a person not having experience that the board considers necessary for the company secretary this is at the discretion of the board depending on the functions depending on the work that they think their company should be able to discharge then finally this is a courtesy of a court of law because the position of the company secretary is a senior position it has some managerial aspects anyone who has been disqualified from managing companies directly or in indirectly by a court of law as a result of some offenses they have been, they have they may have committed in relation to the management of companies is also disqualified from appointment to the position of company secretary let me now discuss matters removal of the secretary removal of uh, the secretary removal of the secretary the removal of the secretary now 
the secretary will on, can only be removed by the person or the authority that appointed them to office. So we are noting that uh, the secretary, the secretary can be removed. The secretary can be removed by the board. The secretary can be removed by the board. So since it is the board of directors that appointed the secretary to serve as company secretary, it is again the company's board of directors that have the power to remove the company secretary from office. But there's something that we must remember. The company secretary was appointed to office uh, courtesy of a contract of service that was entered into between the company, that is the directors on behalf of the company, and the company secretary. So again, the removal of this uh, 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 company secretary from office must be in obedience, must be compliant with the terms of the contract of service that the director entered into. That the removal, the removal must be in accordance, must be in accordance with uh, the provisions, in accordance with the provisions of uh, their contract, must be in accordance with the provisions of their contract. So the contract uh, by which this director serves would also go on to provide uh, for the circumstances under which uh, the secretary can be removed. Either we are removing you as a result of an expired term, either we are removing you as a result of failure in the performance of your duties, either we are removing you from office as a result of uh, gross misconduct in the performance of your duties, those must be stated out in the contract, and it is on the basis of such stated terms on the contract that the secretary can be removed. So their removal will be by way of notice. The removal, the removal is by way, is by way of a written notice, is by way of a written notice, by way of a written notice, uh, given to uh, the secretary, given to the secretary uh, by the board given to the secretary by the board. So in the procedure of removing them, we are looking at uh, there being a board meeting to consider the removal of the secretary, reference to the, the secretary's uh, service contract to see the set out grounds under which they, we will be removing them. Then once the board passes a resolution to remove the secretary, the notice originating from the board must be served to the secretary indicating the wish of the board to have the secretary vacate office in accordance with the terms of uh, their contract. So that is the removal of the secretary. I now want to discuss the contractual capacity of the secretary. The contractual capacity the contractual capacity of uh, the secretary, the contractual capacity of the secretary. We're asking ourselves this question. Can the company secretary enter into a contract on behalf of the company? Can the company secretary engage the company into a contract? Can they bring on third parties and the company on board into a contractual relationship? What is the binding nature of this contract? Is it enforceable against the company? Now, historically, uh, and this is spelled out uh, by common law, that the company secretary was a mere clerk. They were a mere, a mere clerk. They were a mere clerk with no contractual, with no contractual uh, capacity that historically the company secretary has been viewed as a mere clerk, that his position is that one of a clerk with no contractual authority to bind the company. That anybody who entered into a contract uh, with the company secretary on behalf of the company, then that contract would not be binding on the company because the secretary did not then have the capacity to contract. But we are saying that this position has changed. This position 
this position has since changed, that in the present moment, the company secretary's position is a senior administrative officer of the company. And as such, a senior administrative officer, the company secretary does have contractual capacity to bind the company. But we must say their contractual capacity will be limited to their duties, that they will only be binding the company in respect of contracts entered into within their functions. So presently, presently uh, the secretary the secretary has um, contractual capacity. They have contractual capacity. And we are specifically saying that the secretary, the secretary can bind uh, the company, can bind the company in contracts, can bind the company in contracts relating to, in contracts relating to uh, their duties relating to their duties or if you like call them functions so those administrative and statutory functions of the secretary that we shall be identifying later it is within those statutory and administrative functions that the secretary can be binding uh, the company in a contract just to preempt something if you look at the role of the company secretary one of their most uh, one of their duty that stands out is to arrange company meetings ensure that uh, the the necessary meetings that must be held by the company are so held so imagine an agm and the company secretary is arranging for a meeting venue so he has to engage a third party to organize uh, the meeting so hiring space um, um telecommunication equipment if necessary, transport if necessary. Because such contracts are in relation to their role, their duties as the company secretary in arranging meetings for the company, then in such contracts, the company is bound by such contracts entered into by the secretary in the performance of their duties to the company. So that is the contractual capacity of the secretary. Let me now say something about their legal position, which introduces us to the duties of the company secretary. Legal position of the secretary, the legal position, the legal position of the secretary. Now, any time we ask ourselves about the legal position of any other officer, be it the secretary, be it the auditor, be it the director, we want to define a relationship between the officer and the company for the purposes of laying a foundation of the duties that would be expected of that particular officer towards the company. Now, if you look at our company secretary, in some respects, they act as an agent uh, of the company. In some respects, they are acting as an agent of the company. They are acting in a representative capacity uh, to this company. In particular, uh, imagine uh, contracts in contracts entered into, in contracts entered into, on behalf, in contracts entered into on behalf of the company, in contracts entered into on behalf of the company. Now, in respect of those contracts where they engage um, third parties on behalf of the company, then we could consider the company secretary as an agent of the company. So all those duties that an agent should perform towards their principal would be implied in such circumstances. The agent could also be seen as a trustee, a trustee of the company, could also be seen as a trustee of the company, that they are trustees in these transactions where they are to act in the best interest. They represent or they act, they represent, they represent, uh, the interests, they represent the interests of the company. They represent the interest of the company in their actions. But 
their most suited position, their ultimate position, is that one of a fiduciary. They are a fiduciary uh, to the company. They are a fiduciary to the company. Now, the fiduciary position is an equitable. This is an equitable position. It's an equitable position creating, if you like, imposing, imposing equitable, imposing equitable duties, imposing equitable duties upon the secretary, imposing equitable duties upon the secretary. It is on the basis of this agency, trustee, and fiduciary relationship that we can now discuss the duties of the company secretary. What duties should they perform? Duties of the company secretary. Duties of the company secretary. Now, we can put the duties of the company secretary to two categories. The first category of duties will be the equitable, the equitable also known as the fiduciary, the fiduciary duties, the fiduciary duties of the secretary. Then we have a second category of duties that we will refer to as the statutory duties or the administrative duties. We will look at that later. Let's first identify these equitable duties. They are as a result of this fiduciary relationship between the company secretary and the company. One of the duties of the secretary is the duty, the duty of care. The duty of care. That in the exercise of the functions of the secretary, they will exercise due diligence. That they will show skillfulness that they will not by their actions cause the company loss by their negligent actions. So the duty of care requires the secretary, uh, requires the secretary, requires the secretary not to be negligent, requires the secretary not to be negligent, not to be negligent. So. As a result of the negligence of the secretary, if the company were to suffer loss, then the company could be suing the secretary for compensation. They could be suing the secretary to recover such losses on the basis of this equitable duty of care, that the secretary has neglected their duty of care, and as a result, the company has suffered losses. The other duty that the secretary must discharge to this company is the duty to act bona fide, duty to act uh, bona fide, the duty to act bona fide. The duty to act bona fide on the part of the secretary is a duty that requires the secretary to act in the best, to act in the best interests, to act in the best interests uh, of the company to act in the best interests of the company. This duty will present itself in all those circumstances where the company has a choice to do between two or more things. That the option they must be taking is the option that is in the best interests of the company. That is the duty to act bona fide. Always go with the option that is in the best interests of the company to which you are the secretary. The other duty is the duty to account, the duty to account, the duty to account, that the secretary must maintain a proper account of any proceeds, any assets or money that come into their hands in the performance of their role as the secretary. That they must maintain, they must uh, maintain, they must maintain a proper they must maintain a proper account. They must maintain a proper account of money, of money or assets under uh, their care. Money or assets under their care. This is duty. The other duty they have is the duty to avoid, duty to avoid conflict of interest. 
duty to avoid conflict uh, of interest, the duty to avoid the conflict of interest, where we are saying, as a fiduciary, the company secretary must not put themselves in circumstances where their duties to the company and their personal interests are in conflict. Now, where in life these uh, conflicts become unavoidable, then there is a further duty every other fiduciary, the company secretary involved, must perform, which is the duty of disclosure. The duty of disclosure. The duty of disclosure. Now, this duty of disclosure requires the company secretary and every other fiduciary that in any circumstance where they have gained by reason of their position, any time they have earned a secret profit by reason of acting in the position of the company secretary, then such gains, such profits must be disclosed to the company. Then in such circumstances, uh, even where a conflict had been presented, the conflict is said to be resolved with the disclosure of such conflict and any profits they may have earned in their position as a fiduciary. So these duties will be strict in the sense that the breach of these duties will occasion uh, consequences on the part of the secretary. We noted that if they don't discharge the duty of care, they could be sued for compensation where they have uh, not avoided conflict of interest or not disclosed, such profits could be recovered by the company. They could also be sued to account for any money or assets that come uh, into their hands if not properly accounted for. So let me now discuss the second category of duties. The second category of duties, the first being the equitable or the fiduciary, these are the statutory, these are the statutory duties. They are also described as being administrative. They are also described as largely being administrative. They are the duties of the company secretary as a result of uh, the requirements of the law and the service contract by which they may be appointed into the position of company secretary. So they include uh, things such as um, maintaining, maintaining uh, company registers, maintaining company registers. So this could be the register of members, could be the register